Right, so let's now talk about where these elements come from, because that's another fossil. So the elements in the universe are also fossils from the beginning, because they tell us something about conditions when they were formed. So let me um, first show you the periodic table of all the elements, okay? Um, so these are all, all the elements known to man, from hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, up to, you know, um, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and um, all, all, you know, etc. okay? Um, um, zirconium, radium, all sorts of things, okay? And you can see that a few of them, the ones in light blue, were... It really came from the Big Bang. So it began with hydrogen. That was it at the, the beginning, so our theory tells us. But at the Big Bang, as I'll show you in a second, produces, is able to make, because it was so hot and so dense, the light elements, some of the light elements. It can make mostly helium and little bits of lithium and beryllium, but it doesn't make any more, okay, apart from a bit of boron. All the rest basically comes from stars, okay? Um, and there are a few things that are man-made uh, very, very rare things, thanks to, you know, uh, nuclear explosions and high-energy collisions. People actually can create artificially very short-lived elements. So let's not talk about those, but that does expend, extend the periodic table. But you can see that stars account, look at all the green, um, these are exploding, and the, with a dollar sign, these are exploding stars called supernovae. They account for an awful lot of what's going on. Okay, so basically what this means is that we are made from a mixture of the Big Bang and the ashes of the stars, because um, all of this plays a role in the synthesis of the elements. So let's begin with the Big Bang and the light elements. Um, so Gamow was the pioneer of, um, of this idea. He was the first one that took very seriously the notion that the universe was very hot at the beginning, the Big Bang was very hot, and therefore was the dense, was the ideal environment to, for nuclear reactions to make elements. And with his student and his colleague, um, Herman and Alpha, they basically talked about, you know, the first half hour of the universe and argued that the, the elements were made. The light, that they first thought they could make everything in the Big Bang, but they were wrong, and it turned out that, about that, and it turned out that, um, that, that they could make helium, lots of helium, okay, and a bit of deuterium, a bit of lithium, okay, and these more all have the, have the right value that we observe today, and so because these elements agree with the observed number, okay, they, they always curves cross at some point, we think they must have the right answer. This has, there's no other way to make these elements. Uh, there's far too much helium in the universe, in the sun, to be made in, in stars. It must have made very early. Likewise, deuterium is only destroyed when, you know, in, in the, at the present day by stars. And the fact that we measure some in the older stars tells us also it's a cosmic thing, lithium too. So th this is sort of proof that everything was made in the first half hour, the first few minutes of the universe. Okay, um, so the light elements are part of the story, okay? But they couldn't make carbon in the Big Bang, which is critical to life, because there simply um, wasn't, uh, wasn't time enough to build up. And so a more stable environment was needed, um, and this environment were, was that of stars, exploding stars, stars that were lived and died very rapidly, and we see around us regions where stars are being born and dying. It's no mystery. We study this in astronomy with our telescopes. And so in some sense, the elements that we have in our bodies are really just the ashes from, from dead stars. Um, so how does this work? Well, a star that's, um, say, 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun starts off being hydrogen with a bit of helium, um, but mostly, it, in, the centre is mostly hydrogen to start with. Helium is just a, you know, a, a minor, a fairly minor component. And the, and the star gets so hot that it undergoes thermonuclear reactions in the middle, just as in the hydrogen bomb, which is an uncontrolled version of, of thermonuclear reactions. But stars, it's more controlled because there's enough mass around it to stop stuff squirting out at first anyway. And so the hydrogen burns into helium, and that releases energy and keeps up the star, stops from collapsing. But then at some point, you run out of helium, Okay, and that's, that's, uh, that's bad news um, because you have no more fuel. It's just as though you know, the fossil fuel on the Earth is exhausted. But the sun can then collapse a bit and heat up, and then you can burn the helium at a higher temperature. It's more massive, more protons. It's harder to, harder to burn, higher, higher charged nuclei to carbon. And then eventually you work your way down to iron, and iron is the ultimate slag heap of the universe. There is no more energy to be extracted. 
And so when you finally burnt the court iron, the whole thing was exploded. It collapses and explodes. Okay, the center collapses, raises so much energy, it so ejects the outer parts. Okay, and these outer parts then circulate around the galaxy. And the person who, the people who discovered this, um, um, a pair of um, UK astronomers who moved to the States, um, the Burbages, um, Fred Hoyle, and Willie Fowler, um, an American uh, a nuclear physicist. Um, and um, he was a great fan of um, um, trains, toy trains. And they gave him this, I think, for one of his birthdays. And, um, and as fate has it, it was only Fowler that got the Nobel Prize for this discovery um, because these other three, one, one thinks these other three ended up doing far more un un unconventional things in cosmology. I mean, um, and so uh, anyway, Fowler was given officially uh, the credit for the uh, discovery. But all, all the four of them played a major role.